Okay. Okay. So for that, I will be needing your support. First thing is, no one will call sir. My name is Pankaj Patel. Okay. No sir title anywhere. Okay. So Pankaj Patel. Pankaj sounds better. Rule number two. Let's make it more interactive. You can talk me anywhere, whatever doubt sir has. So that it becomes more interactive rather than just a monotonous. The whole intention is just to interact. Presentations like are just a way to narrate it and uh, write it. Okay. So ground rules are clear. Clear? No, it's not clear. Again, somebody said so. Ground rules are clear or not? Clear or not? Again, sir, you need to tell me what are you guys? Okay, so the title which I thought was aligning academic research with the industry perspective. Now, sometimes I was talking to Sushma Man that if given a chance, you know, to go back 13 years, 14 years back, 2000, when I completed my master's. How I would have visualized to do the research work based on the knowledge or the expertise I have gained in past career. I'm sure, like me, everyone was a fresher, you all guys are still a fresher, trying to understand the basic concepts, how to implement it in career research. Okay? Now, some addition is given over there in terms of what industry. Or how this can be done in a more uh, standardized way? Probably that will add more meaning, right? We all know that there is something called SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, right? Every instrument, every equipment, SOP, so follow me, come out there, okay? So, all said, then, if you have more perspective, more expertise coming out of that, probably our thoughts change. Probably you will say, okay, I would like to do this thing in this way. So with that thing in my mind, I thought, let this be the title for today, so that you can talk on it. Okay, so this is not a presentation, it is more like a discussion, it's more like a sharing of your experience with you. Okay, so I'll take one standard question to everyone. How many of you have opted pharmacy by choice? Good. good, quite good number of students. You all know pharmacy very well. Something, no? That's good. So, okay. So, I'll be very open. 2001 was when I started my reform. The only thing I knew about pharmacy was I can open a medical shop, I would be having a license. Okay, that was the only knowledge I had. So with that knowledge, I went to a couple of colleges. One was ICT, where I interacted with the HOD at that time. Uh, pardon me, I don't recognize her. But she changed my life. The only question I had asked, and when I tell this, I literally get to I had asked her, what is the scope of pharmacy? And the answer which I got was encrypted. She said, who are you to say that what is the scope? You are the one to create that scope. Okay. And what she also mentioned and that surprised me, in India we say that medical is a noble profession, right? We say, doctor. the same thing happens in Australia. That's how they look at conversation. Do we do conversation that way in India? Probably the answer is no. Right? So today what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to give you a bigger picture on a global level. Okay? So if you see pharmacy or the global pharmaceutical market, in 2023 it was 1.6 trillion dollars. Okay? Healthcare is the third largest sector globally. 
this is what pharmacy healthcare profession is all about so if at all anyone is having that doubt that today i am in a wrong field the answer is no you are not you are in the right field today everyone talks about healthcare healthcare system right unlike uh, past in 2025 years there have been significant changes now we talk about ai correct we talk about machine learning we talk about so many things other than just three four fields uh, so the field has increased it is widened the scope has increased so this is what the world is coming very specifically to indian pharmaceutical market one of the most glorious times you can ever imagine that is what indian pharmaceutical market is till 1970s we were heavily dependent upon import all the medicines used to be imported however the country is now export oriented we are serving more than 40% of generic market to us so us is something the super giants right but proud to say that their 40% medicines are manufactured in india 25% medicines of uk are manufactured in india in terms of volume we are the third largest in terms of value it is the fifth largest if you talk about biotech in asia we are the third one okay talking about the numbers 2021 we crossed 42 billion in sales total revenue earning from pharma this is purely pharma not the entire health sector okay 23 we closed at 55 billion and out of this 55 billion 25 billion was purely export that shows the confidence which global market has in india the quality of medicines we talk about the volumes at which we are making it that is phenomenal not even exception it is phenomenal okay similarly when you talk about vaccines we are proud to say that 60% of vaccines of global is getting manufactured in india okay so that is the strength which india caters going back this space what we are imagining that by 2030 it will be 130 billion dollar so growing at a cgr of double digit when the less industries are going by that pace and when we say this we are equally focusing even on the domestic market so 25 billion in export 25 billion in domestic so it's not like we are only only export oriented They are equally interested in making domestic market also that catering to small small native uh, villages, catering to uh, you know uh, medicines which were never thought of being manufactured in India. There are certain laws which we have bypassed only to ensure that life-saving medicines are being made at much economical cost. Okay, as we go on, probably it has based on those as well. so having said that where are we heading now what is the outlook of pharma or say healthcare system talking about r&d first globally there is heavy investment being done on research and development and that's where you know the industry needs young scientists young minds like you guys who come up with creative ideas who come up with disruptive ideas who come up with something Which can change the society, the way this healthcare system or the pharmaceutical system is looked upon. So that's where you know R and D will be a big engine to drive this entire thing. Next big thing is supply chain. Now, what do you mean by supply chain? COVID happened in 2020. What happened? Everything got disrupted. The biggest challenge which pharmaceutical companies used to face was getting the raw material. And mind you, in spite of these challenges. we were the only country who produced a huge number of vaccine and exported it as well okay so that shows how well we were efficient in overcome the challenge but having said that when we faced it we know that these things can come if you have so that's where down they are going on you will see in 2020 2021 lot of startups came up and those were basically focusing on logistics they are focusing on supply chain they were talking about building chains how to you know overcome these challenges with that's another area pricing and reimbursement 
how well you try your medicines, how well this can be reinforced, because you want to reach to the larger audience. So, a couple of good schemes even the government has came up with, right? Generally, that you have Pradhan Mantri Jangan Yojaya, this one, the medicines, right? Everyone is going to have a free medical, uh, this one. So, those are the things where government is also focusing, not only in India, but globally. Patient centric, very important thing. So, when we talk about patient centric, what do you mean by it? Every individual is different. Same dose cannot be given to everyone. But yes, to meet the larger audience, we know that this is a particular dose that is given. But yes, your gene makeup is different compared to mine. So that's when we are also talking about having a patient centric approach. And this will become a big thing in going forward because when you talk about gene delivery, when you talk about the RNA, this is the thing which is changing. Digital transformation. So much focus is being given on digital transformation. The way things have changed, especially during COVID, it gives a new plethora of opportunities like how digitally you can transform an entire sector. That's where people are now focusing. And adding to it, the AI itself becomes a bigger picture. Elevating health equity. So everywhere now people talk about a healthy lifestyle rather than going into a disease. So people focus more on, you know, uh, uh, let me say like nutrition, what kind of nutrition you are taking, what kind of lifestyle you are having. So that's where entire scenario is changed. More equity or more uh, focus is given on health sector. Right? Evolving portfolios and value creation. So when you say value creation portfolios, portfolios in terms of which type of molecule you are targeting, which kind of age groups you are targeting. So that is where this entire thing is getting focused on. So this is something which you will see in the next 5 to 10 years. The point to mention over here is this is where even the RD will focus. Or this is where the venture capitalists would like to push their I guess everyone is well versed with this right so far, right? Something which we discussed in B farm, something which is there in first year M farm, right? One or two billion dollar it takes to transmit for molecule. Why do I show this slide? This slide shows the efforts which we all together because getting one single molecule takes 15 to 20 years. Who has that much dedication? The dedication is to serve the mankind. Okay, so the profession which we are in, it demands patience. And when you talk about patience, masters and PhD is exactly for this patients. So that is why I have shown you this slide. There will be incidences where you will say like, okay, it is becoming too happy. Look at the efforts. It starts right from your basic research. And that's where I also want you to focus on. Your basics should be very clear. Every time I meet any student, I only say one thing. Get your basics clear. Because that is the foundation. You want, you can talk about nanoparticles, you can talk about AI, you can talk about anything. Without basics, it's nothing. Okay? So it's simply like, you know, when you teach a toddler, you will not directly teach him how to read. It will be first like building maybe city one two three. So that is what is response. Correct? So build your business. You have earlier discovery, pre-clinical, then the big phase of clinical development comes into picture. So you start with 10,000 molecules and finally you have five to ten years. Because it has to go through all this screening process. Then you have the FDA review. So once you clear everything, if FDA is not satisfied with it, you again go back your work again and you know try to answer the questions which are there so that shows the patience which it takes to get one single molecule in market this is a very important slide and always i am very proud that you know talking about this thing when you talk about pharmaceutical research which are the three important aspects first is academia because that is where, as I mentioned, we get our V6 here. Second is the industry, where it actually sees the place of writing. 
you know, you have your research looking at the market. See, the best feeling which you will get once you go ahead is when you see a medicine which was developed by you on a particular chain. And trust me, there will be no match, whatever salary you talk about, whatever it is. The moment you see that, okay, this medicine which is there on chain, either I have done the analysis part, either I have done the formulation part, or I have done the filing part, and this molecule is over there. That feeling will be same. Because that, that gives an eternal happiness. If you see the resume of people who put it for a job, they mention it that you know I have worked on these these molecules. We brought name naming the molecule at least a category, and they take a pride in interview in saying that okay I have worked on it because it gives a very different feeling. You know it in and out. It's like your baby you have nurtured it. Okay, so you have academy, you have industry. What is this? Is the regulation because unlike other industry, we are in a highly regulated industry, and I believe today I will be focusing more on this. I believe that you know, 30 years, 15 years back, which was lacking in my life or my period of course, this understanding of regulation what regulation says about what do you actually mean by safety, what do you mean by pharmaceutical. I think the thing which I would like to focus on because this will be thing which you will be learning once you are in the industry. Okay? So, when you take all these three together, then only you see that about the molecule or say uh, a generic medicine is coming into the market. So, in nutshell, it's a cross functional, interdisciplinary, and high popularity. So, there would be n number of cases where we know that the industry has come together and the medicine is very much. However, I have listed only three of them, which I feel is very The first one, which obviously everyone must be knowing, is Pensil. Everyone has said it's a repetitive discovery, correct? Right? Early 1928. But imagine till that time there was no antibiotic. People used to die and there was no reason, there was no cure for it. One discovery, incidental discovery, it changed the entire life. Okay. What happened after 1928? Probably something which we might have read somewhere, but we didn't recollect it. So I will briefly share that journey with you. 1928, precisely September 1928, was the time when Alexander Fleming discovered that there is something unusual thing to observe. Where there was this zone inhibition, and he thought that, you know, several of focus on the right. How to purify it and how to actually make a molecule out of it? It took nearly 20 years. Over there, it was that intention from the cat, it was that intention from industry, all the big pharma giants, you name their company, Pfizer, Abbott, everyone came together. And to add to it, it was a time of World War II. So, a lot of casualties were there, a lot of mortality rate was increasing. Everyone on came forward. And, and huge, huge investment, along with scientific knowledge, resulted into penicillin. So, that was the biggest game changer in pharma. The next big thing came was toxorbicin liposome. Toxorbicin, we all know it's an anti cancer molecule, right? Till the 90s, it used to be in the form of a injection, either lyophilized. Majorly lyophilized, not even because of the stimuli. But the challenge was cardiac myopathy, nephrotoxicity. Then, being an anti cancer, it's non selective, it is almost a healthy sense. So, this was one of the biggest problems. Professor Aaron Burns at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. If you would like to work on liposomes, please read him. He is the Bible of liposomes. You name a thing and you it. And why do you have it? Okay? So, some basic science which actually resulted into applied science. He was the one whose team thought of working on liposome because 
they knew that if you encapsulate it into a liquid form, probably you can reduce the size. That was the first part. Second part was how to ensure that it is there in circulation for a longer period of time. So that at very less dose, I am still ensuring that it is very good circulation, but still able to uh, do the effect. That is where evaluation came. So doxorubicin, I don't know. The brand name is Doxil. Okay. Doxil is pigmented liposomes. So what are pigmented? molecules are there which makes the pyrophilin. So that there is no reuptake from bodies. Okay. The next was amphotericin B liposome. Product name is liposome. I am coming from research. Professor Jill Elder Moody. Had some to this study. In early 80s, she had taken sabbatical. Sabbatical only to understand how to make amphotericin more patient friendly. Lot of cases of fungal infections were there. People used to die. Okay? Because of the toxicity. Amphotericin, biggest toxicity is nephrotoxicity. So, how to control it? That's where she also started working on that. And in 1993-95, this product was registered in the market. So, I believe these are the biggest game changers we have. That doesn't rule out that we have them. There are plenty of them. There are microspheres which have changed entire way of how hormone therapy is being given. So for example, lipolide, lipolide hormone, you have injections. Like every day you have to take that injection. Either for PCOS or for you know, other indications or even for cancer. But with microspheres, now you can have it for say 28 days, 3 months, 6 months, even 1 year. So that's how drug therapy systems and everything is changed the life altogether. Okay. Hope no one is wondering if sales right is a bad Okay, so with that, uh, probably I'd like to touch us upon what is the gap which we feel today. When I say we, I'm trying to uh, represent that industry company. So, this is the definition I found that, and probably this is best of research in 25. So, it says that research is creative and a systematic work, a systematic work undertaken to increase the stock of knowledge. So, three important words creative. Systematic. It has to be systematic. You cannot go randomly. The moment you say random, anyone can do it. Okay. So I tell you, even in industry, it used to happen that you know the best you know what is your karangi actual result is there. This is actually the fact how industry used to perform before 2000. So do some permutation combinations, you get some result, and then you will analyze why this result. But now if you are doing research, there has to be a reason. Okay? The only conflict I used to have with my manager during my uh, research days in industry was when I used to take the second batch, there has to be a reason why I did. Why is the rational behavior? Because that is what an incompetent teaches you. So when you will take your first batch, there will be some thought behind it. Right? The moment you try to take the second batch, first you will think about what was the reason. What I had intended, what I thought, how to fix that, plan, which parameters to be changed, then only you will take a second batch. It won't happen that you will take that batch and then you will decide, okay, this was my one. So that's what it says, it has to be creative, but at the same time, systematic. And it has to increase the stock of knowledge. First stock of knowledge, because what happens is when you talk about research, you have to be open. Now, why I say this? Say, suppose your writer says that, uh, or your intention is to increase the viability. However, during your studies, you found that it did not increase the viability. Rather, it increases the viability. Will you report it or you will not? Sure. That has to be there because it's an observation. That's what research is all about. The moment you say that, this is my objective when this has been the result, the entire purpose has been disrupted. As a research scientist or as a researcher, whatever the observation is there, I need to report it. 
because whatever you do today somebody will be taking that way if you are reporting anything negative or say anything is happened but you are saying no oh, this is positive probably that person will be increasing a bit soon like you know am i doing it correctly because we the report kiya tha ki hota hai so even if you say that no ye nahi ho sakta hai this is not the right path probably he will try it but he will try it so whenever you talk about research whatever reports whatever results you are getting it has to be okay wide gap between the acquired knowledge and required knowledge what do you mean by that knowledge dono jagah par hai correct khali word ka fer bada hai but that is a big difference the knowledge which you are gaining right now the theoretical knowledge those are nothing but your acquired knowledge. but probably industry has a different set of Unfortunately, the industry is being made in that way that you know we want a plug-in plug pay type of system. Our industry say, "Bahar hai, you go there and get cash." Because they also have that pressure. And to the day we are looking for a generic market. Only maybe ten percent, fifteen percent will be there. No problem for innovation. Where probably you will have that relaxation that put up the theory about and then come up with the data. Okay. So the demand is how to fill that gap. Your acquired knowledge and required knowledge both has to go simultaneously. Okay. As we progress on, I will tell you how to increase that knowledge as well, or how to, uh, you know, shorten that gap. Rapid pace of change in outside business environment and advanced technology. When I showed you that slide of how to twenty twenty, that shows how rapidly the technology is changing. Earlier we were talking about tablets. Today we talk about gene therapy. Such a huge difference in last 10-15 years. New technologies are coming almost every day. Every year you see that there is a new technology. More number of biosimilars are getting approved compared to your OST. But that doesn't take out the fact that OST is not there. The other molecules are not there. They are still there. They are rather more patient convenient. Correct? Most of them are very good. Must bring both academy and industry together to bridge this gap. How do you do it? That's how probably we want to learn it. How do you, you know, decrease that gap? Lack of industrial interest topics in academic research. Why do I say this? Does it sound familiar? Kabi kisi ne bola hai chhi. So as we move on, I'll show that as well. Okay, thank you. ब्रेक चाहिए था तो बता देना चाहिए था ना यूनिवर्स टेकन जो चाहिए Visible to everyone? Should we start? So, lack of industrial interest topics in academic research. 
That is the reason why I am saying this. Because, as I said, uh, when you see the topics which we come today, uh, there is definitely some gap where even the industry wants that, you know, uh, maybe a guy should work on something topics which are very relevant to the industry. Some of those topics I'll cover as we move on. So what kind of gaps are you talking about? Understanding the regulations is very important thing. So what do you mean by USP? What do you mean by IP? What do you mean by IP? These are nothing but pharmacopoeias, right? But have we actually gone and checked? Yes? All for your drugs. Have you checked the general chapters? So that is where things change. I'll give you examples also why I'm saying that. So understanding the pharmacopian monograph for all the all the countries, however, it's possible at least for the molecules on which you are working, the excipients on which you are working, or the raw materials on which you are working. At least those monographs be aware of. Next very important thing is the regulatory bodies. What does the US FDA has to say about it? What does the European nation has to say about it? So those are the regulations. I see the guidelines, I'm sure everyone has heard about it, right? It talks about efficacy, quality, multidisciplinary research, everything, correct? Has everyone heard about IPEC? IPEC, Sunae? International Pharmaceutical Excipient Council, Sunae? Iska Matar Nadi Ho Jai. Either yes or yes? Okay. Kaan Par Sunae? So this is a regulation, uh, this is the government, uh, a body which can uh, regulate the excipients. Excipients as such, they are not regulated by as such any government agencies. It's more like a private body which is governing. So we'll talk more about it. Okay. Familiar? Familiar? Yes. So I'll, I'll tell you one small story, okay? It's okay to sit here, right? I'll tell you one very small story. Uh, BPharm first year, organic chemistry. I got 15 out of 50. I was very happy. Wait, wait, wait. Picture of Lucky. Sir, 35 is 2.5. Yes, sir. What I did, the first book which I purchased was because basics are clear. Intention is that I wanted to go to medical. So I used to study library and I used to prepare for competitive exams. First year we found, actually went in that. First year we went in that. We had a semester of that. But trust me, these are nothing but our Bible. No Google search can replace them. Lieberman, Lachman, Morrison, Boyd, Satoshkar. These are the three books which I had purchased and they are still there with me. I used to feel you know, very happy when I used to make notes for Pankurath. Uh, People used to read some different book, Lipping Court, I guess, and I used to read for Satoshi. That's only because if you have interest, probably you will read more or you will try to learn the basics of it. All said done, Google is always a search engine. Remember that. What I have seen in today's generation is that you type something on Google, the first article which comes, you will open it, you will read it, and probably your entire thought starts from there. There is something called as peer review journals. There is something which is also called as edge factory owner or like is how you cite it. So consult your teachers, consult your faculty, which are the journals you should refer to. When I say journals is a scientific publication. Because in today's time, even they are learning because of these publications. There won't be any quality of work. Probably if you really go through it, a lot of them have simply copied. Some textuals which have been copied, nothing else. Today in the first half, I was telling to someone that when you actually go to a research paper, go deep dive into it, which excipient they have selected, why they selected it, what was the reason behind it. I know that whole part also. But Books will be always your Bible. Jitna ho sakta hai, please read the books. Whenever you have picks, go back to the books. I'll give you an example. Whenever I was asking which topic you want to 
very happy that you know guide is giving the freedom and nanotechnology of both of our guys and madam i want to work on liquid nanoparticles she took a pause okay the guide is another center she took a pause she said yes i can guide you because physics remains the same so whether you talk about microparticles you talk about anything and on the day it is suspension and that is how she guided me that is how we took that work ahead and all that is focused on the basics so why we are forgetting our basics you can all the literature references sub article ke naam rehte hain you will have seen that book ka naam hoga i refer to this chapter okay so read the books you will get lot of knowledge lot of insights and definitely going forward even if you see that you know when you have the new volumes they are also adding the new technologies which are coming in okay so always refer to the latest technology would be called uh, the latest version okay so now to start your basic thing you will take the api request with your aapko api mil jayega what is the first thing you will do cva certificate of analysis uspe se kya kya dekhte hain purity purity and जोर से लंच हुआ ना सबका माइक इट्स ऑलरेडी लिस्टेड देयर राइट मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इन इंश्योर वेदर द मॉलिक्यूल मॉलिक्यूल हैज एनी काइल सेंटर इज इट हैविंग एनी इंश्योर इंश्योर फॉर्म बेस्ट एग्जांपल वी टॉक अबाउट ग्लूकोसिट्रोजिन सिट्रोजिन ग्लूकोसिट्रोजिन देयर इज अ डिफरेंस राइट सिट्रोजिन हैज 10 एनजी डोज ग्लूकोसिट्रोजिन हैज 5 एनजी डोज Classic example how a ratio number or sorry how a ratio number or a ratio number can actually reduce the dose. It doesn't have like that. You talk about you know having that sedative effect, but you use it to reduce it. So do we work into that direction? So those basic things has to be there. As I said, our whole project is like a big. एक एक चीज को minutely आपको देखना पड़ेगा right from the API. Whether that API and that delivery system are actually coming together or not. API is highly highly hydrophilic, but I am looking for a liquid-based delivery system. Is it the right approach? API is highly lipophilic, but I am looking for a hydrophilic system. It works. That's it. So when we talk about metformin, one of the oldest molecule, you want to make a sustained release. You are using HPMC for it. Why? Because it's a hydrophilic drug, and when you know hydrophilic polymer, there will be a good affinity, and you will get a better system. Plus, it is most economical. Why we forget that thing? We always talk about you know technology, and we want to make cost effective. But the moment I see the polymers which has been used, the excipient which has been used, that not only works, not for little bit. So let us try to think in a way that what research is actually. And will the API and the delivery system actually available? Please pardon me, our subject students. So most of the examples you will see will be obviously okay. But similar logic applies even for analysis, even for pre-med. Okay. So you will also check about hygroscopicity. Very important thing because there are certain molecules which so just fit in a petri dish and they will absorb moisture. The first thing you need to do is always check the LOD. Why LOD? When you check the LOD, you need to back calculate the SA. If LOD is increasing and it is increasing beyond the specified limit in the COA, first thing you should do is don't use it. If you have no other option and if the API is stable, try it a bit before you use it. See, there are certain things which impact. But when we sit and analyze, probably we have no clue because certain things we might have missed up. If we pay the gross copy, did we calculate it there? Okay. Degradation mechanism. This is also very very important because your method, formulation method, analysis method depends on this. Whether it is having pH dependency. So need to check on those things and accordingly design your method. If it is you know degrading in uh, aqueous medium, and my entire formulation is based in aqueous, 
or hydrogen covalent there will definitely more degradation into it unfortunately when we are analyzing it at least in formulation we don't do much work on the related substances we just work on the sa this much sa i got but what is the remaining part 3% 4% those are impurities okay so i'll be talking more about this because past 6 years 7 years excipient is what i've been in without so i'll probably skip more on this and i'm sure this is going to help you all as well as i said unlike api which is highly regulated excipient still don't have much regulation over there okay how does excipient help all the formulation things or all the biopharmaceutical modifications you want to do is nothing but your excipient on you right you talk about odt what makes it odt is you put it in you talk about sustained release what makes it sustained release is for polymer which is nothing but your polymer right so everything your heart of formulation is nothing but your excipient we say that it is inactive because it is not having a pharmacological action. but other than that it is functional that's the more reason why you need to focus more on the excipient part if not at least equally like you do for epa okay so it can be natural if you take gum tagapan both things from as a natural sodium cmc it can be semi synthetic again taking origin from your natural again but doing some modification like like classic case can be hpmc and then completely synthetic the best example i can think about is nothing but vinyl pyrrole derivatives or say carbomers those are completely synthetic these are regulated by usp general chapter sometime back i mentioned for okay general chapter usp general chapter 467 Has anyone heard about it? No one, correct? So this is where that gap is. We say that we have seen the monogram, but what about the general chapter? General chapter, how far you spend there? This is where it comes into effect. So USP general chapter four sixty seven, it talks about residual solvent. We know that it is almost a highly regulated field. When you talk about polymers. You use solvent in the manufacturing process. Solvent can be categorized into three parts, three types: class one, class two, class three. Class one, we carcinogenic. You have to neglect it as as long as possible. Don't use it. Is what USP says. Class two is still permissible, but not for oral administration. Class three is where you go for oral administration. Okay, I'll give you an example, like. A best polymer where you can actually categorize it. Need to be pharmaceutical grade. This is what we always talk about. Why do I mention it? There are n number of excipients or say raw material which fall both in a personal care grade as well as pharma. In fact, they also come into industrial grade. One classic example is hydroxyhydrocellulose. cellulose. Hydroxyhydrocellulose cellulose has multiple applications. It goes into paint industry. as a water soluble paint it goes into personal care as a thickener it also goes into pharma for sustainable use now imagine if someone uses industrial grade do you see there is any chances any possibility of happening this it's a live example i have seen it we are visiting one company in bathi okay we are talking about Which was having HEC, hydroxyhydrocellulose. Brand name is Hydrosol. He said, "No, Papa, he reduced the rate. That was only a CO per charge in the industry. The only comparison he was making was Hydrosol, Lam Lam, Lam Lam, HEC. This was what he had done. He had done the research. That was the only thing he was looking at. He was production chain." we had to tell him that this is not a pharmaceutical grade so what is a pharmaceutical grade pharmaceutical grade is where you say that this is manufactured under gmp condition where you know that i am monitoring the impurity profile of it. the way you said that for epi you have seen the ca you must have seen the ca of excipients as well so over there they list that these are the impurities which we are monitoring 
we have the secondary data for them. Okay, these things you won't find for your personal care or for the industrial care. Okay. It is regulated by USP general chapters, IPEC and XIPEC. Like IPEC, we have XIPEC also. That's another governing body which controls the XIPEC industry. So they will give some certification also to XIPEC manufacturers. How they give this? They go, they audit that facility, they will check all the documents. But all said done, it has to be taken at a pinch of salt because there is also some challenge. So the best thing is IPEC because it's an international regulation. And very important part which I mentioned that this is the most critical but often less of raw material in the formulation. Because not much attention is it paid. And this is not only with academics, even in industry. And the example which I gave you. Only you know big pharma companies where they focus on quality, probably they are aware of big differences. The moment you talk about the having diagnosis. Have to literally go and educate. So that is where you know being in sales, it helps to go and talk. Okay. So as I said, I'll take certain examples wherein I'll describe you like how this industry gets regulated or what is the critical parameters for it. So vinyl pyridone derivatives. Uh, since I work for a company called Ashland. Probably I'll give you the brand names which Ashland has. But that doesn't mean that there are other brand names. There will be other brand names also. So when we talk about vinyl pyridone derivatives, these are the class of excipients which have revolutionized your uh, dosage forms, especially uh, as a functional excipients. You have povidone chemistry. So plasmon K10132, which is also called as povidone K32. Polyplasmon XL, XL10, Ultra, Ultra 10. Okay, we are talking about your cross code, which was as a super dosage. Sometime back, I was telling to Madam that you know, we have come up with a new polymer called as Polyplasmon Plus, which is a directly compressible super dosage. This is Plasmon S630. This is nothing but a co polymer of Envilite to Pyridone and Vinay acid, 62 protein ratio. This goes very well as a solubilizer, especially for a hot metal texture. Now, why I am saying all these things? Povidone, copovidone, cross covidone, all are vinyl pyridone derivatives. In their manufacturing process, there involves the stage which generates peroxide. So the point is when you are using any of these exhibits, either from a hand or from BSF or any of them, please ensure what is the peroxide content in. Because if your area is oxidation sensitive, that is where it will impact. Because higher the level of peroxide, more will be the generation of oxidation. Okay. So this is how excipients play an important role. You need to understand what are the critical material attributes of it. When you talk about polydons, it will be the K value. What is the K value I am getting? What is the viscosity I am getting? Correct. Similarly, the peroxide content. So, if you are working on the highly uh, oxidation sensitive, what we suggest is go with the ultra grades for cross covidones. When you talk about ultra grades, probably over there we are controlling the uh, peroxide level to less than 30 ppm. So, the USP monograph says less than 400 or 500 ppm, but we are controlling it 30 ppm. That's how excipient changes your portfolio or say your population. So, if you know that the EPA which I am working on is having oxidation sensitivity and you need to use a cross code, look at the peroxide. Okay. Next example is HPMC K grades. Everyone has heard about HPMC, right? I don't see profile with the Most widely used into sustained release formulation. So, under this, you have K4M. K15M, K100, K200, K250, and it goes up. It depends upon the selection. I won't go much into it because it will take a huge time, but it depends upon what kind of application you are looking for. Okay? K200 is having the highest viscosity. What are the critical material attributes? As the name suggests, hydroxy, propyl, methyl cellulose. You have hydroxy and propoxy groups into it. That is what, what controls your release. Similarly, the viscosity and very important is the particle size. 
So whenever you are working with HPMC, ensure that you are looking into this consideration. Now what happens is, suppose you put a request to a vendor, say for example, you put me a request that you know, I need a support of HPMC K100 or say, you have catalog, you have catalog, you say, I need HPMC K100 XR. Because we have categorized CR, XR, XR. But did you wait to check what is the difference between CR, XR and XR? And the best way is talk to that person. Write an email that I need to have more understanding. Look at the brochure first. What does it say? Where is the differentiation? Take all the three COAs before you take the sample. Analyze it. See the difference. What is which I am desiring? Which is the exact grade? That is what you should do. Rather than doing a random selection or just saying that, okay, this research paper I have just ordered you. Probably it may not work for you because your molecule may be different. Your environment is different. Okay? Everyone talks about injectables, right? Long acting injectables, PHE, polyvalent, proglycolates. This is having the widest CMAs, medical intelligence, right from the ratio of lactate to proglycolate to glycolic acids. What is the ratio? It comes under 50 50, 85 15, 75 25. Lot of competition combination is there. And everything depends upon the release profile which you want. Similarly, molecular weight, inherent viscosity, monomer content, because these are used, uh, made using monomers. So definitely there will be some acid or monomer which is left in. Now why this is critical? Because it can also lead to degradation. These monomers. And most important is the stainless chloride, the thing content in. Because they are used in, uh, 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 through catalysis. So when you make it through catalysis, the problem is some residue will always be. And if it is not purified or if it is not within that specified, it will start degrading your polymer itself. Okay. So these are nothing but your critical material attributes when you talk about the vaccine. These are some small lists which I am talking about because in the sake of time, I cannot cover everything, but I am just trying to give you a gist that what all parameters you need to look into when we talk about exhibits. Sometime back, I was talking about USP General Chapter 467. Okay, best example is carbomers. Carbomers, they were actually a byproduct of time. Does anyone know this? Correct. B. F. Goodrich, everyone must have never heard the name. B. F. Goodrich was a tire manufacturing company. So, 1960s, they found that something sticky mass was coming out of it during the manufacturing. They purified it. They used it, but the first use was in personal care before taking it to pharma. Okay? And that time, whatever the knowledge they were having, the first polymer which they came up with was and 940. Both were synthesized in benzene. Which is happens to be class one solid. However, this classification of class one, class two, class three was similar in 70s and 80s. Okay. So whenever you are using carbomer, ensure that it is not 934 or 940, even for that matter, 934 PM. So carbomer is a classical case where you will see 934. So carbomer 934 and carbomer 934 NF and also carbomer 934 PNF. What is the difference? Carbomer 934 means that it is for personal care. 934 NF is a pharmaceutical care. However, it still has a benzene. 934 PNF is also for pharma where the benzene is within control limits. All said done. It still should not be used for oral use. Now, why company is making it? Because historically, some products are still there in market for which the advantage is more. That's where 934 they have converted to 934 PM. But all said done, never use 940 NF for your 
topical application. Even for that matter, topical application. So if not 940 and F, what is the next choice? So for 940, which is the highest viscosity, it's 980 and 980 and F is the co-solvent where you have NXN along with ethyl acetate, which is still safe for topical. But if I have to use for oral, then go for 971 PNF, 71 GNF, then polycarbophil AA1. So this is a classical case where USP general chapter 467 plays a role. Lot of carbomer manufacturers are there. They will say that we are carbon. But no one talks about this part. Why? Because not everyone is complying to it. So being a pharmacist, being a researcher, look into it before you actually apply it. Okay? So sometime back I was mentioning that, you know, uh, the topic which are being taken in, uh, in a case should be industry focused. What do I mean by that? One very burning issue right now in the industry is nitrosomine. Everyone talks about it. And when I say this, there are companies who have made dedicated team working on nitrosomine. Every month there is formulation withdrawal, product withdrawal from because of higher level of nitrate nitrate. The best example is metformin. Every month you take that, some other the company has withdrawn that. Why? Because the levels are increasing. Regulatory agencies day by day are becoming stringent. Why there is so much talk about nitrosomine? Because these are cultural cases. All said done, we are in a regulated industry. Okay. So numerous drug molecules coming under the lens, met for every time, every time, every two or three months, there is a new molecule which is added. How does this nitrosomic come from? Definitely the first source is your EPA. Because if EPA is sensitive or having that structure, that is where it comes from. Having said that, even the excipients play up. How does excipient play up? The drinking water which we consume, that also has nitrosomic. So, European agencies, they have also made a norm how much nitrate or nitrate can be there in a Water. All the excipients, especially the natural origin, the cellulose we talked about, they are made from either wood pulp, cotton liters, and during this stage they are water -based. So that is the water which is contributing. How you get rid of that water? What is your drying process? And how stringent are you controlling it? So initially they used to give a declaration that okay, this is the entire raw material, nowhere I'm using uh, any nitrate containing components. Cellulose, we all know there is no nitrogen in it. So, how does it come into picture? It's only through the source of water. Or if my treatment involves anything to do with those nitrosomate nutrients. So, that's where the industry is focusing on. Whether you talk about API, you talk about excipients, eventually the final uh, catchhold will be for the formula. The company who is making. So, say for example, uh, company X, they have used metformin. Metformin is taken from a company called TB. HPMC is from, taken from a company called D. But it is the company X who has to ensure that the final product is having nitrate level below the prescribed limit. FDA is not going to ask the excipient manufacturer or the EPA. But what does the formulator do? He or she will check entire source, whether it is API, whether it is excipient, any raw material which is from within the waters. That's how you ensure that quality is there. So when we talk about you know academic taking some industry driven topic, probably this is one such classic example. If you talk, uh, if you you know if, if you ask me one simple study, can we you take three four HPMC samples from market? Analyze it, how much nitrosomines are there? Okay, you can go back to that company and say, okay, I have analyzed it, this is how I find it. They also will feel that, okay, you know, you guys are talking something which is very much relevant to them. Probably they will take that work ahead. Okay, so this is one such example. 
we need to have a highly sensitive selective analytical method for that. So this is where you know analysis comes into picture. A lot of focus is being given, given on the analysis part. Is it a sensitive method enough to analyze it? Companies are now coming up with grades which they call it low nitrate grade acetates, especially for MCC, HPMC. Why do we talk about MCC and HPMC coming as a low nitrate? Because they are being used in bulk in huge amount. So if I have to give you an example on say metformin SR tablet. For 500 mg SR tablet, the tablet which will be around 800 mg. 500 mg is 200 mg is HPMC. So next to API is the HPMC. That's why formulators are evaluating HPMC. Whether that HPMC is having any source of uh, nitrate nitrate. Same the case with MCC, goes as a bulking agent. Probably it will have 200, 300 mg content per tablet or maybe 100, 150 mg, which is roughly like 20 to 40 percent of a tablet weight. That's where we talk about having low nitrate weight. So going forward, all these excipients you will see, they will come under low nitrate or low nitrate ultra pure grade is what they call out. So what we re really require over here, we definitely need a very highly collaborative approach. What do I mean by this? When I say highly collaborative approach, it's like, let us do something which is arbitrary. Need not necessary that there has to be a very fixed, uh, you know, industry expert coming over here. Can we make it more informal? Can we make it more frequent? Can we make it more periodical? So that there is a lot of knowledge sharing and, you know, uh, Thought sharing ideas coming into it. That's where probably we'll have more collaboration. So research needs to be more market driven with commercial mindset. What is actually needed? The technologies which you are working on. First thing is whether that technology is scalable or not. Every time the first question will be whether this technology is scalable or not. Same thing applied to your mindset also. Whenever you are taking that work, the method which you are selecting. First question should come, is this scalable? If not, consult with someone, consult with your faculties, consult with someone from industry. That look, I am thinking to work on this line. This is the method which I am selecting. Do you feel that this can be scaled up? What are the present technologies which I can use? Is there anything I can replicate into my lab? Probably that will be the best way. Something which is already there and the same principle you are able to replicate. Sometimes I am saying that you know, if given a chance, what different would have been that problem? So in my m work, when I prepared lipid nanoparticles, it was a you know, solicit. But imagine making a hundred liter of a batch, having a proof can it is be possible. Answer is no. I have to take multiple batches, collate it together. And then probably one hundred liter batch will be there. But imagine if HPH is there, high pressure homogeneity. What's the reason? It will take some hours, and your hundred liter batch is ready. So that is what I'm telling about. You know, think in that way. Even if I'm making liposomes, reverse phase evaporation, REV method, what we call about, that you know, it gives a lot of time. Uh, it's the best suited method for hydrophilic API. But is it feasible in industry? The answer is no. Industry uses lipid film hydration method because that is more convenient. So that knowledge sharing has to be there between industry. Workshop and training both for faculty and students. Why is that? Because ultimately the faculty also, if they know that these are the practices, they will tell the students also the same way. So, uh, back in Lugri's old days, what we used to do is, for faculty also we had workshop. So, we used to tell them that how this polymer has to be used. We used to tell them the difference of solvents. Okay. Similarly, if you know companies like Sipla, companies like Sun Pharma, they open their doors, they come and say that, okay, this is how the research we do in industry. That's how probably, you know, the students are coming. Industry cannot say that, you know, the entire batch we can take, but it is a some group of students. Can we look into those kind of collaboration? The answer is yes. That is something which will change. Last but very important, 
alumni students play a big role. Why I say that? Because someone who has graduated from your college, someone who has sat on this bench, if they will tell you something, it will be connected. Correct? You will feel that okay, I can go and talk to her, I can go and talk to him, okay, I can give you more insights. Because you have that sense of belongingness. Correct? They are the ones who can be that bridge between the industry and the academy. Because they have seen now both the sides. Okay? I found this quote very much relevant. Tell me and I work it. Teach me and I will learn. But involve me and I will learn. That is what we say about collaboration. So with that note, thanks for your patience listening. Any questions? Yes. 